Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza. This is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. Today, we are going to share the story about a family-style resort that inspired one of the most popular movies of the 1980s. I'm not going to give away the title, but if you are familiar with the movie that I am talking about, then you know the most famous line of the movie was said by Patrick Swayze's character, Johnny Castle. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Nobody puts baby in a corner. If your family was a prominent East Coast Jewish family back then, like the Hausman family from the movie, you would always spend one week every summer at this kind of a resort. Well, the whole backdrop of that movie is based on a real-life Kutcher's Hotel and Country Club in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. Even the name of the resort in the movie is based on the real-life resort. In the movie, the man who owned and ran the resort was Max Kellerman, who ran Kellerman's Country Club. The real-life man was Milton Kutcher. It was an all-inclusive mountain resort that primarily catered to Jewish families from the East Coast of the United States, mostly from New York City. The only reason I bring up the movie is because I want you to be able to picture the kind of place this was. It had everything for a family to enjoy. They had lots of activities like dancing, swimming, ice skating, fishing, boating, tennis, golf, programs for kids and teens. They had all-you-could-eat meals three times a day. Each evening, the ballroom featured a big-name celebrity from singers like Frank Sinatra, Dolly Parton, Dean Martin, Louis Armstrong, and even Elvis Presley. It featured comedians like Alan King, Jackie Mason, Rodney Dangerfield, Joan Rivers, Red Buttons, Jerry Seinfeld, and Don Rickles. It was like a luxury summer camp, except it was for the whole family. Now, what does all this have to do with basketball? I promise I will make the connection to this game that we all love so much. But I am asking that you follow along with me on this story as I give you the background and context for how this Jewish resort became the hottest place to see some great basketball in the 1950s and 1960s. But let me first take you all the way back to the beginning of the 1900s. Hundreds of European immigrants were arriving in New York City every single day, especially many Jewish families from Eastern Europe. Many of them settled right in New York City where Jewish neighborhoods popped up quickly. They developed their own neighborhoods and even their own economies in this new land. Some of these families moved to upstate New York, particularly Sullivan County where the land was cheap. These Jewish families became farmers where they were able to raise chickens and cows. One such couple, by the names of Max and Louise Kutcher, opened the Kutcher Brothers Farmhouse in 1907. These families were able to carve story was true. His family was indeed given an improper benefit, but they could not prove it. Still, he had to miss the entire year of basketball. For his second year of high school, he was now 18 years old and was declared ineligible again because basically the school board still had not made up its mind about whether or not Bebo's family had received their house for free. This was roadblock number three. So he had two years of high school completed, but he still had not played a single minute of basketball in a game, although he was allowed to practice with the team in order to keep his skills sharp. And near the end of his sophomore year, he married his girlfriend, Jean Chrislip, and they had their first baby during their junior year of high school. And they gave their baby the nickname of Frank, 
which was short for their last name of Francis. Of course, if this were happening today, the parents would sue the school board to either prove the infraction or let their kid play basketball. But this was 1950, and that is not how things were done back then. So now, it is his junior year. Bevo is a newlywed and a new father, and he has finally declared eligible to play on the basketball team. His coach gave him the number 32 for his jersey because that is how many points he wanted Bevo to score each game. He nearly did it, averaging just under 31 points per game that year. But unbeknownst to anybody, that would be his final year of high school basketball. Talk about a one and done. See, even though he had one more year of high school basketball to go, he had turned 20 years old by the beginning of his senior year. In the state of Ohio, as in many states, your high school eligibility for sports expires on the day you turn 20 or complete four years of schooling, whichever comes first. And in his case, turning 20 came before he completed four years of schooling. So that was roadblock number four, having his senior year of high school basketball taken away because of his age. As I said before, this guy can't catch a break. Like in my case, I completed four years of high school and four years of playing for the football team while I was still 17 years old. That is when my eligibility expired. But of course my story is very different from Bebo's. But some good news did come along. His high school coach, Newt Oliver, was hired to be the new head coach at Rio Grande College and he convinced Bevo to follow him there. Even though he had not yet completed high school, the college enrolled him because of his basketball skill. So finally, something went his way. While Bevo was taking college courses, Coach Oliver also had Bevo enroll at the local high school to complete his final one and a half credits in order to get his high school diploma. So he enrolled at Rio Grande College in Rio Grande, Ohio. The school had only 92 students, with only 38 of them being men. That is a very small pool from which to form a basketball team. The previous year, they had won only four games. This school was far better known for training Baptist ministers than for developing basketball players. Since they were a tiny college located in the middle of a farming community, their home gym was affectionately known as the Hog Pen. And with a name like Rio Grande, I assumed that the school was in Texas or New Mexico, somewhere near the Mexican border. And I have to be honest, the pronunciation of Rio Grande just hurts my heart as a Spanish speaker. Instinctively, I want to say Rio Grande, or at the very least, Rio Grande. But it's their school, and they can call themselves whatever they want. Anyway, Bevo was lighting up the scoreboard with his shooting. His coach designed the offense that Bevo would score in huge bunches. He said, quote, I knew that people wouldn't pay to see five players score 15 points each, but I knew that they would flock in to see one player score 50, unquote. Thankfully, the rest of the players bought into this system and were totally on board. They knew what they had in Bevo, and they wanted to win some games, and they were completely comfortable with turning Rio Grande basketball into the Bevo show. But just to be clear, while the offense was completely designed around Bevo, it was not like the rest of the players were a bunch of slouches. They could score as well. While many college players during that time shot the two-handed set shot, the Rio Grande players were shooting one-handed jump shots and runners in the paint. They were a genuinely potent offense. At 6'9", Bevo was a force to deal with for any opponent. He was often the tallest player on the court at the level of college that he played. He scored in the 60s half a dozen times and into the 70s on two occasions. But many people disregard these scores because most of them came against business schools or two-year colleges, which is an even lower level of basketball than when Rio Grande played. They were playing teams well below their own division. It would be like a team of 18-year-olds playing a game against a bunch of 14-year-olds. So many of these games were not considered official. But on January 9th, 1953, they matched up with Ashland Junior College, a two-year school from Kentucky, which played at the very lowest level of college basketball. 
and Bevo just torched them. As he got into the 70s and into the 80s, his teammates began to feed him on nearly every possession. At the time, the record for the most points scored in a single game by a college player was 86. So he was only three baskets away with nearly five minutes left on the clock. So he gets to 86, but there is still more time on the clock. With just a couple of minutes left, he hit the magic number of 100 points. At this point in the game, his teammates were wondering how far they could push this thing. With those last couple of minutes, they continued to feed him the ball. When the final horn sounded, Bevo had 116 points, smashing the old record. More importantly, at least as far as I'm concerned, they won the game, 150 to 85. This was national news overnight. His name was in every major newspaper across the country. Nobody had ever seen numbers like this before. It was an absolute revelation. This was a new NCAA record for most points scored in a single game. The team did not lose a single game that year. It was an incredible feat no matter what level of basketball was being played. They finished the season with 39 wins and zero losses. And even though they played in no postseason tournaments, Coach Oliver ordered a banner to be made up declaring themselves the 1953 national champions. No other school from any level went 39-0 that year. And that banner still hangs in the gym today. Scoring over 100 is a really hard thing to do no matter what level of basketball is being played, which is why it almost never happens. At the NBA level, we all know that it has only happened once in nearly 65,000 games played in NBA history. But in the euphoria of such an accomplishment came roadblock number five. The NCAA declared Bevo's record scoring game as invalid. They completely wiped it from their record books. In addition to that, the NCAA also wiped out about half of Rio Grande's victories that year. Because Rio Grande played so many weak opponents, technical colleges and seminaries, the NCAA said that the only games that would count would be games against other four-year institutions. Rio Grande was a four-year school and their schedule was almost exclusively two-year schools. And this is a good place to take a break. I'll be right back with the story of Bevo's second year at Rio Grande College. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and let us get on with Bevo's second year at Rio Grande College. That year, Coach Oliver decided to play more competitive schedule to keep the NCAA off their back. They played teams like Villanova University, Providence, Wake Forest, Butler University, and Arizona State. This gave them more credibility since now they were playing some schools that were above their level. They even beat Villanova in Philadelphia, and they beat Providence in a game played in the Boston Garden. So they proved that they were a truly competitive team. That second season at Rio Grande, Bevo averaged 47 points per game. Then they had a game against Hillsdale College. Hillsdale was a four-year school from Michigan. Any records broken against them would stand up to NCAA scrutiny. So with that as the context, Bevo scored 113 points. Again, he went over the 100 point mark. Granted, Hillsdale is one of those weaker opponents. Hillsdale is a small Christian college in Michigan who puts their focus on preparing leaders in ministry and business, not developing basketball players. But still, to break 100 points for the second time put his name back into the newspapers. And this time, the NCAA officially recognized the game and Bevo's record. Rio Grande was sitting pretty looking at two more years of Bevo. They were selling out their games and reporting. At this point, Milton's son Mark had been running the resort for many years. At the end of 2013, the Kutcher family decided to cease operations and sell the property with all 1,500 acres to a new developer who built a yoga spa and wellness center. But more cities, and they were no longer competing for college players and free agents. As the only national level professional league, they could work together to create a draft and put into place rules around how free agents would be signed. 
I also want to clarify something here in regard to how records and games were kept. Since the NBA's history and leadership started with the BAA, the current NBA includes all records from those first three seasons as the BAA in the NBA totals. That means that championships, points, wins, losses, and all other statistics from the BAA are still valid as NBA totals. All records from the old NBL are not included. For example, the Lakers won the 1948 NBL championship, but it is not included in their total of 17 NBA championships as of the completion of the 2020 season. And all of those points that Mikan and Dolph Shea scored in the old league do not count for their NBA totals. The same thing happened with the NBA when they merged with the ABA under the NBA leadership in 1976. All of those points that Dr. J scored in the ABA do not count in his NBA totals. If they did count, then Dr. J would be the number 8 scorer of all time. But since those ABA points do not count, Dr. J is considered only the number 70 when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. And don't forget to check out sportshistorynetwork.com. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.